Good morning. Good morning. God bless you. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study, where we go through the Bible chapter by chapter and give you your whole Bible back. Mm -hmm. This type of teaching is considered uh, expository teaching as compared to topical teaching. Expository teaching is where you go through the scriptures chapter by chapter, book by book, and you let the material present itself to you rather than extracting the material through different verses and passages uh, in or out of context. And uh, it's something that I continually come back to. Paul told Timothy, give attention to reading. Mm -hmm. In other words, we're supposed to pray. We're supposed to do many things uh, uh, commended to us in the scripture for the maintenance of our spiritual good health. And we have structured our Christian culture in our activities where we definitely sing uh, every week. And, <laughs> and my goodness, we don't forget to take up the offering now, do we? <laughs> And uh, then we do most teaching that is done is topical teaching, uh, popular teaching. Good morning, Pearlie, Carolyn, Robert, Michelle, Barbara. God bless you. And uh, but we often leave out expository teaching. And when you do expository teaching, uh, then the content of the scripture itself sets the baseline for what you're being fed spiritually out of the scripture as opposed to addressing something because it's popular because it it seems in someone's opinion to be to be relevant and uh, again it's like one uh, individual said if you want to know what god is saying go read all the verses in your bible that are not underlined mm -hmm. I always appreciate those when we do this kind of teaching that come back and say, um, I didn't know that was in the Bible. Top of the morning to Miss Ann from Ireland. <laughs> and hi, Ellen. Hello, Ann. <laughs> Praise God. Good Glory. to see you. Glory. We had a new listener that just uh, wrote about two weeks ago and said, I just found you guys, and I'm in California, but I'm going to listen to Morning Light every day on my morning commute. That was exciting to hear. Now, Ann McCormick, as a first of the year, Ann sits on our board of directors. And one of the really nice things that happened is we were in a church locally here that we have, Kitty attended years ago, and we've just been visiting over there. And it so happens there was a couple from Northern Ireland, from Belfast, that was speaking. And when we came in, all the seats were taken, except the ones right by the front, right by the speakers. And so... At the end of the service, the pastor had everybody turn around and pray for each other. So we got to be prayed for and to pray with the speakers who had come all the way from Belfast. And after we prayed, uh, we mentioned Anne's name and, and also Graham. Uh, Graham McCartney. And they and so we were with them last weekend. We know, we know them. And what a small world uh, it is. And we have such a heart for for Europe in the mm -hmm. United Kingdom Amen. that uh, uh, we felt that it was just necessary, just like God spoke to us about Hispanic countries and through a series of situations, we ha we came into relationship with Dr. Rosie Mar Martinez and we asked her to, to keep ourselves accountable to that aspect of our vision. We asked Dr. Rosales Martinez to sit on our board so that we don't forget the mandate we have to minister in Hispanic countries mm -hmm. and likewise in in Europe. Mm -hmm. Such a large contingency of people that interact with the Father's Heart Ministry are in Europe. We don't ever want to neglect you. That's right. uh, we, and because neglecting you, we're neglecting a mandate God has, has given us. And so it's our honor to have Anne uh, and also Graham uh, to be on our board of directors. Now, we are, yesterday, I think our chapter was 63 verses, <laughs> and today it's only 10 verses. So Kitty said we're going to have to talk slow. really no. slow. We know how to fill in the gap. We're preachers. <laughs> As we had Apostle Don Madison, one of our Papa Apostles here in Branson, uh, 
uh, if he was here, we he could probably make that ten verses. He kind of is, is very deliberate in his his diction and how he he ministers, and I love it. I just think it's so it's it's, it's wonderful. Branson as well. When you have a phone conversation with Don, you, you just you just gotta you just gotta wait for it. Yeah, and, sit down uh, and put your feet up. He's like, there's this movie, what was it, Lord of the Rings, and they had the tree people, and Treebeard, and Treebeard said anything worth saying was worth taking time to, to say, say it. <laughs> I always think of Papa Don. So Joshua chapter 16, more about the territory that, the, of course, Joshua is all about taking the land coming out of the wilderness into the promised land, which for us is coming out of your problem <laughs> mm -hmm. and into your potential. And there is land to be taken. And then the land had to be divided to, between the different tribes. And the inheritance was not chosen. We would think, you know, being uh, most of us from representative republics where everything's done on an egalitarian basis and it has to be fair and everybody needs to get a fair say. Uh, but how many know the kingdom of God is not a democracy? The way they chose the inheritance was by casting the lot, casting, consulting the Urim and the Thummim. And, uh, and isn't that amazing that it wasn't by some logical rationale? They didn't call out the surveyors. They didn't poll the population and say, now we need to have so many acres per capita, and this is how it has to be divided up. They didn't do any of that. They didn't form a, a committee. They simply consulted the high priest, the high priest in a pouch on his breastplate. He had something called the Urim and the Thummim that were like sacred dice that would be cast. And uh, some uh, Jewish uh, historians or commentators, they believed that actually instead of a set of dice, they said the 12 stones on the breastplate, whenever they would ask of the Lord, the stones on the breastplate would begin to move and form, almost like a crossword puzzle, would form words in answer. And uh, some people believed, on the other hand, it was a supernatural light that would come out of the stones like a projector whenever they put the songs up on the screen at <laughs> church and would give the answer. But whatever the case may be, that's how the territories were assigned to different tribes. And it wasn't just saying, oh, look what you get, because this territory was populated by giants, by enemies, by armies, by people that were saying, no, you're not, you can't have this. <laughs> so in actuality, when they consulted the Urim and the Thummim, they were basically being told, here's where you go fight. It was an assignment. Do you understand that's how the prophetic is supposed to work? People come many times and they say, please, they, they have their idea of the prophetic. Why do you think the Bible says despise not prophesying? 1 Thessalonians 5, 7. Because in the prophetic, it was like casting the Urim that they got an assignment. It isn't about, you know, people say, tell me what God's going to do for me. But that's not how the prophetic works. All of the promises of God come wrapped up in a responsibility postured in an assignment. And if you're not willing to take responsibility and receive an assignment, then you're going to be very disappointed in the prophetic, and it's been that way uh, since uh, the first century when Paul said, hey, he understood. He was dealing with people. I oh, them prophets, you know, put it on the shelf. Mm -hmm. Well, what would happen if a tribe was given a piece of territory and they say, oh, just put that on the shelf if that's God? We'll come into possession of that property. If it's not, mm -hmm. well, it wasn't it's God. No, the way it works. they had to go do something. Yeah. And uh, once the territory is promised, they had to go take their land. So the things that God has promised you, God's promised me great things. That meant that means he's throwing you into a big fight. <laughs> God promising you great things is equivalent to, to him. Uh, like, you know, the, here in the Ozarks that we have the, the idea of when you want to learn how to swim, uh, granddad grabs you, picks you up by the straps of your overhauls, and throws you into the pond in the creek. <laughs> and or into the creek, and you're going to learn how to swim. And so it's the, the dimension of the promise determines the intensity of the battle. And so how many of you believe in for great things? Well, what you're really believing for is a big fight. And the only good fight is the fight you win. And... Uh, so what do you do? Is it enough 
to just believe what God has promised or is there something you must do? Let me tell you, many of you are living with disappointment and you've got a deep down torque on the inside of you, an angst that says, why haven't the promise of God come to pass? This teaching today will help you. What happens when circumstances change? We're going to see that in today's teaching. Circumstances change. What do you do about God's promise? What do you do when the word given, whether by Urim in the Old Testament or by a prophet, doesn't no longer fit to your circumstance? I have found God is frustratingly reticent to change his word. Mm. I've been through hell in my life in situations where the landscape totally changed and nothing fit what God had told me. And I would go to God and he would say, what's the last thing I told you? And I would say, that's not helping me now. <laughs> and he would say, do you trust me? Let me take it from here. Amen. And I would come back and I would say, you know, God, it's, it doesn't, it's not, it's not, that's not helping me now. But what's the last thing I told you? And guess what? Everything he said, when I got over the offense of God not doing things the way I thought he should have done them, and began to cooperate with the plan, I walked into a territory where for eight years, everything I do has become as effective as if God said it or did it. Amen. So when I give this teaching to you, I know whereof I speak. Uh, this is something that Kitty and I have tasted, something we've seen. We're walking in a dimension that, look, I've been, I've been walking with God a long time. And for the last eight years, Kitty and I have been walking on territory that is rare, that quite honestly is very, very little that I've even heard hinted at, the level of entitlement that we have experienced. And in this teaching is going to be reflected some of that understanding. And if you're looking for something different, let me tell you something, folks. It's available if you can detach yourself from the self-referral of suffering, the angst and the torque and the anger and the frustration of why things aren't turning out no. according to your expectations. It could be different. Mm -hmm. yeah. God wants you to be, my title was, God wants you to be bendable, sendable, and spendable. Yeah. Kitty puts it this way. Blessed are the flexible. They don't get bent out of shape. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> so, big, long chapter. What are we going to do when we get to Psalm 119? Are we going to do that in one day? We're going to get our camping gear. and camp Talk really up. fast. Dr drink an energy drink. Uh, <laughs> no way. <laughs> Joshua 16. Read verses 1 through 4, please. Okay. Verse 1. And the lot of the children of Joseph fell from Jordan by Jericho unto the water of Jericho on the east, to the wilderness that goeth up from Jericho throughout Mount Bethel, and goeth out from Bethel to Luz, and passeth along unto the borders of Archai to Adaroth, and goeth down westward to the coast of Jephthali, unto the coast of Beth Horon, the nether, and to Gezer, and the goings out thereof are at the sea, so the children of Joseph, Manasseh, and Ephraim took their inheritance. Now, notice it's what it says. The lot was cast. You see, the lot fell. Mm -hmm. What they're talking about is the Urim and the Thummim. What happens is they would stand, the appointed representative would stand before the priest. In this case, when they were dividing the land between the tribes, the head of each tribe would stand before the priest and would, would whisper his question so nobody could hear it. Hmm. And then the priest would reach into the pouch where the Urim and the Thummim were, and he would cast the Urim and the Thummim and, and then get an answer indicating what land belonged to them. Mm -hmm. Now, Sweet. is your inheritance something God gives you or something you take? Notice notice what it said. How come they, did, they cast the lot and God gave them the property? No, they cast the lot and then the tribes took their inheritance. You must take what God has promised. Hmm. Jesus said the kingdom of God does not come with observation. If Joseph, Manasseh, and Ephraim just sat back and the lot was cast and they said, yep, took out the little smartphones, took a picture of that lot. See there? Look, we're observing what God has done. Nothing would have happened. Mm -hmm. You really need to get this. Who's the prophet in your life? The prophet in your life is the guy who arbitrates for you the assignment of heaven over your life. Amen. The promise of God always comes wrapped up. God is a good gift uh, giver. 
He always wraps his gifts like Martha Stewart, you know, wrap it up in a nice little bow. Now, and it's filled with responsibility. You have to do something. The kingdom doesn't come with observation. You must do something. Now, and, and the interesting thing about that is things are the way they are because of what you're doing. If you want something different, you must do something different. And that which you must do different is in the very area that you are desiring change the most. And that is the very area where you many times will feel like you are least equipped and least uh, energized and motivated to make change. I, you'll say, I can't change. I can't do anything different. Yes, you can. <laughs> See, that's the stronghold, pulling down strongholds. You're, the image in your head is that I can't do anything different. Yes, you can. And then here comes the excuses. I'm too old. I'm too broke. I'm too sick. I'm too this. I'm too that. Something has to be different. We have all of these excuses as to why not. Excuses were what caused Saul to lose his rulership. Saul made excuses. He allowed mitigating circumstances to cause him to step out of the profile of what the prophet told him to do, and he lost the throne. Well, you're going to make up your mind. Are you going to be a Saul or a David? Are you going to make excuses due to outside influences? Or are you going to do what God told you to do? Is your inheritance something that God just sovereignly gives you, or is it something you have to take? There is, this is a, a very important question. Failing to comprehend this results in believers living their whole life falling far short of what God has for them. How do I know God wants something different for me? Do you want something different? If God wanted you to be content where you are, you would not want things to be any different than they That's are right. right now. The ache is the prophecy. The ache in your heart is the prophecy over your life. That's what I think it's Psalm 38 says, uh, that God gives you the desires of your heart. God causes your heart to ache with the DNA of what he purposes to give you. Amen. But because of unbelief, we allow that ache to become fractured on the inside of us and spring up a root of bitterness and unbelief mm. and rationalizations and, and why isn't God doing what he said? Because we've been taught a religion of failure. We've been taught a religion that worships at the altar of poverty and suffering and sickness. We have gilded with religious glory the very conditions that Jesus died to take off of us. Mm -hmm. What part of life and life more abundantly does, does suffering and sickness and poverty and brokenness and rejection and emptiness and loneliness, where does all that fit in? But yet we take those things in order to feed our pride while we're suffering. We'll say, I'm going through this because it's God's will. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. You need to break that deception off of yourself right now. Amen. So they inquired the the land fell by lot to the children of Joseph. This was inquiring of the Lord by Urim and Thummim. The Urim and the Thummim, I love to study them because I, I had a dream one night and I really, it was more of a visitation and I still to this day, I, I don't quite understand everything it means, but I saw the hand of God come down and it was a big hand. It was like probably, oh, I would say it was five feet wide, big hand mm. come down and he had the Urim and the Thummim in his open palm and he thrust it into my belly. He said, I have given you the Urim and the Thummim. It's like, I feel like the little poster I used to have in my place of business of a little baby with a big silly grin on his face. And he, he said, uh, I love it. I get it. I want it. Now, what is it? <laughs> and, and where is it? And where is it? Mm -hmm. Let me add here, too, um, that, you know, the time it takes to have your vision uh, fulfilled I've heard it so many times from different ministers that I tend to believe that it's so. You don't need a chapter and verse, but the, lo the length of time that it takes you to see a manifestation of God's glory is the, the size of the outcome. It's so large. God's putting things in place and putting things in order. I had somebody, uh, when I lived in Seymour and had the restaurant, I toddled over to Branson, which is just an hour away from where I lived and my restaurant was, and um, a minister friend who was prophetic had a meeting, and I just was so hungry for God, I went over to the Branson meeting, and this is 20 years ago, 
and she said, Kitty, um, she called me up for a prophetic word after the meeting, and she said, "There's a, she said, I see Jesus standing right behind you, Kitty, but he's reaching through your middle part, and out front here is a hand, of, uh, in his hand is a handful of keys, and they're gold keys. And Kitty, they're keys to a theater, but they're not coming for a show, they're coming for the glory. Well, I lived in this little tiny town of 1,500 people. There was no theater. There were no theaters in my little town. But where do I live today? In a town of theaters, places where God can, I, I just have, God has aligned my life to where there are a multitude of theaters in this town. And I'm watching and waiting to see how and what he wants to do. And we've, and we've stepped in, we've done something about that on November 22nd. Amen. We pulled out all the stops. Amen. We acquired a theater that people have been trying to bring into the gospel for 20 years and couldn't get it done. And we stepped out in audacious faith and we got a hold of it. And we brought that theater into the kingdom of God and 250 people came out for no other reason but for the glory Amen. and we're not stopping there see Matthew 6 33 seek first the kingdom all these things will be added if you seek the kingdom and all things being added that are defined by the desires of your heart if that doesn't happen God is a liar and you can take your Bible and throw it in the nearest dumpster I get very pragmatic when it comes to the trustworthiness of God's word. But understand this, two things. Your response time to God measures his response time to you. Amen. Your response time to God measures his response time to you. If these tribes had said, yep, that's our land, that's what God wants us to have, and then 20 years later they hadn't got around to it, they were still deliberating on what to do, guess what? Nothing was going to happen. Even if they pulled out all the stops to try and make it happen, they're still going to deal with delays because their response time to God would determine God's response time to, uh, to them. I'll tell you something else. The intensity of your response to God measures the intensity of his response to you. If you take that, God help us, if you get that prophetic word and you have this tepid Kitty says, P warm response. Mm -hmm. Saying, well, that's a good word. Let me just take that and put that here on my bookshelf. I'll, I'll pull that out and I'll think about that. And six months later, you haven't given it another thought. Guess what? You are generating divine delay mm -hmm. of what God was willing to do on a much um, more compressed timetable. Yeah. Your response time to God measures his response time to you. The intensity of your response to what God has said. That's why God doesn't mind confirming a word. But many times confirmation upon confirmation upon confirmation comes and we're still scratching our heads. And everybody around you that doesn't like the prophetic, that despises the prophetic, says, yep, that's wisdom. I've seen books written on the prophetic that, that say, I'll just keep on waiting. Just wait for it. Oh, no. You need to act. See, people that say you need to wait is because they're in love with a plan. But God isn't in love with a plan. He's in love with you. Amen. And even if you do something wrong, he will cause even your mistakes to prosper. He will turn heaven and earth. If you hit the ground running the wrong way, he will turn the axis of your earth to see that you wind up exactly where he wants you to be. God can deal with anything except your refusal to make a decision. And until you, it says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decisions. A double-minded man will receive nothing from God. I understand that most people live their life in the aftermath of that kind of suffering. But what do you want? Do you want a ministry that comforts you in the stagnation of nothing happening? Or do you want somebody to come in there with a spade and start prying you out and dynamiting you out of that place of stagnation to move toward what God has promised? Amen. It's that? not for everybody, I know. Not for the faint of heart, <laughs> I always say. <laughs> As a pastor, I always got in trouble preaching like this because I had more faith for the people than they had for themselves. Come on, pull it out now. So they inquired of the Lord, and they got their decision. You know, we tend to say, uh, notice that, that, what do we do? They had Moses' law. How come they had to go consult the Urim and the Thummim? Here's another thing. I'm standing on God's word. And we got this idea. If I have God's word in my heart, that's all I need. If that was true, how come they needed the Urim and the Thummim? The five books of Moses were in their possession and they hadn't defeated one giant or taken one city in the promised land. Hmm. 
I'm telling you, operationally, now listen to what I'm saying, what I'm not saying. Operationally, it's going to take something more than your Bible to bring you out of your problem into possession of your promise. Amen. They, the, the five books of Moses were in their custody. How come they turned from the five books of Moses and started consulting the Urim and the Thummim? It's not enough. You Operationally, you've got to have the word from God. In this case, they weren't consulting a prophet. They were consulting the Urim and the Thummim. If they were going to take their territory, they needed to be able to consult God specifically on their next move. That's where the Urim and the Thummim come in. And you hear, just ask the average person about that. They've probably never heard of the Urim. Maybe read it one time. It's never talked about. Why? Because we are used to pastoring and shepherding people in the midst of their problem. And we've even defined the wilderness experience as the human experience and Canaan land, heaven. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I love Vestal Goodman, but heaven is not Canaan land because there's giants there. Right. There are cities to be conquered. There's territory to be taken. That's and right. there's not going to be any of that when we get to heaven. That's right. See, it's, it's here and now. It's territory God has promised you, but we're sitting here holding on to the rule book of the Bible rather than going to the playbook of the prophetic. Amen. And saying, this is where we appropriate what God has promised. That's where the Urim and the Thummim come in. Now, there came a time. See, they weren't consulting a prophet. There came a time that God no longer answered through Urim and Thummim. And they went through a breach time there called the book of Judges. But then Samuel was raised up. And I love what happened when Samuel, because Samuel was a prophet who came out of the terrible time. The book of Judges is very much where we've been living for the last, really about the last 1,000, 1,500 years in the church, mm -hmm. where every man does that which is right in his own eyes. And there is no unimpeachable ministry of signs, wonders, and miracles confronting the nation and leading the church. Mm. But that's changing. Amen. But that's changing. But uh, the Urim and the Thummim were raised up, but then Samuel came, and he was a prophet. He says his words didn't fall to the ground. Praise God. And you know what the prophet ushered in? The king. Samuel was to King David what John the Baptist was to Jesus Amen. and we're being raised up in the prophetic to bring King Jesus as well to usher him in in our day Come on. but they would cast the one of the problems with this is uh, when the prophet doesn't tell you what you want to hear you simply ignore or in Old Testament days kill the prophet mm. you get a prophetic word and it's not what you wanted to hear or you don't think it's coming to pass because you're putting more expectation on the prophetic word than upon yourself to find the assignment of heaven that brings the word to pass. Well, then, you know, you, you, you change your sentiments toward the prophetic. You begin to get. That's why the Bible says. That's why God put in his book, despise not prophesying, because he knows that if you properly interact with the prophetic and the prophetic is installed in the church properly, it will bring people to the point of despising the prophetic before they'll despise their own reticence sense to do what the prophetic is calling upon them to do because they're more in love with themselves than they are in love with the word of God. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the disciplining. Follow me and I will make you. <laughs> and every red-blooded American says, ain't nobody going to make me do anything. <laughs> so you could, you, know, you could always ignore the prophet. You could kill the prophet. But interestingly enough, in this case, you couldn't argue with the Urim and the Thummim. The priest would cast the Urim and he would say, there it is, no discussion, that's your territory, whether you wanted the territory or not. And there were times that the tribes didn't like the territory that was given to them, but there was no argument. They cast the <laughs> Urim, there you go, take it or leave it, now it's your job to go take what God gave you. <laughs> that's good. God always expects us to mature into hearing his voice. He didn't leave us with the Urim. In time, he brought us the prophetic. Second Chronicles 20, 20 says, if we believe the prophets, wouldn't it be great if we've all done the, the Urim and the Thummim thing when we take our Bible and we let it fall open? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the guy told, told the joke, you know, about uh, 
he was praying that God, am I going to get married? God, am I going to get married? He really wanted a wife, and he let his Bible fall open, and it said the eunuch shall be blessed of the Lord forever. <laughs> you know, <laughs> rather than question. rather than listening to what God has said. So do we need to go to God and ask him for direction on all things to get our answers? When you go, Sure, you go to God. The point of the prophetic in the New Testament, here's the difference between Old Testament prophetic and New Testament prophetic. Ephesians 4 says God gave the fivefold ministry, including the prophetic, for the maturing of the saints for the work of the ministry, right. that you grow up into the full stature of the measure of Christ. In other words, as a prophet, my job is, yes, to bring you the word of the Lord, but also to activate the voice of God on the inside of you. If I bring you the word of the Lord without activating the voice of God in your life, I have done yourself a great disservice and I have not fulfilled my calling. When I grew up in the prophetic where the prophets treated it like a trade secret and they thought nobody could prophesy but them. And they rejected anyone who claimed to hear God with that unless if God's going to say anything, it's going to come through me. But the prophetic is about raising up. See, remember what we talked about yesterday is the Ark of the Covenant is your human spirit. That's where God lives. That's his sanctuary. We want to subserviate your mind, will, and emotions to the voice of God that speaks on the inside of you. Christ in you is your hope of glory. Christ in me is not your hope of glory. Christ in you is your father. Christ in me is just your brother. Christ in you is Jesus. I'm Christ in me is like John the Baptist. I'm the forerunner pointing you to the potentiality of who he is on the inside of you. And so I become the witness of the Spirit to what God is saying on the inside of you, and he will confirm it as much as possible to defeat the unbelief that's keeping you from acting. Right. And to add to that, Lakeisha, the ache inside your heart, what your heart cries out for is the prophecy over your life. So yes, when you get back to God and you ask him for direction, it's the very thing you put in there before you were ever formed in your mother's womb. So he's in agreement with it. You just need to have that quiet time to get alone with him to discover what that highest heart's desire is and pray that back to God. And if that seems a struggle to you, then start writing down your dreams. God speaks to your, if your old man is defeating you, remember the Bible says your old man will dream dreams. Mm -hmm. If you're, if in your waking life you're having trouble Hearing from God. You should be able to hear from God without anybody's help. And if you can't, then God doesn't leave you there. He sends you dreams. Mm -hmm. And dreams come to warn you. Dreams come to... God speaks to you. It's like my, my children. You know, we always look in on our children when they're sleeping, and they're all angels when they're sleeping. <laughs> it's when they wake up that they're tearing through the house, making a mess, and they get in trouble. But when we're asleep, the old man is in abeyance, he, and so God speaks, and he, put, he speaks to us. What he says to you through a dream can be as much confirmation as what the most powerful prophet would ever speak to you. Because I had a t season in my life that the prophets, you, people have trouble paying a prophet. Let me tell you something. I would have gladly paid a prophet to speak into my life, and they wouldn't do it because they were so full of religion that they couldn't uh, understand how to minister to me because I was too far out of their box. And so I had to get it from the Holy Ghost. I had to hear from God without benefit of a prophet. And I learned how to hear from God without anybody's help. I learned how to put my life on the line and risk everything that I had and everything that I was on something that was not confirmed by anybody. I just got it from the Holy Ghost between me and God. Of course, what I didn't realize is he was training me for becoming a prophet. Hello. Well, I spent 15 years saying I'm not a prophet, I'm a... Advocate for the prophetic. <laughs> See, that's the heart and soul of what God has called Kitty and I to do. And he says, believe the prophets, so shall you prosper. What's the prophet about? The prophet's about prophecy. What is prophecy? Hearing the voice of God and sharing what you hear for the benefit of yourself and others. Testimony of Jesus. It's the testimony of Jesus. A lot of people think they don't need the prophet. The person that doesn't know who his prophet is, is not willing for Jesus to testify in his life. Oh, I don't believe in the prophetic. I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe in the prophetic. So, Jesus, I believe in you, but would you please shut up? Mm. See, the testimony of Jesus, Revelations 19.10, is the spirit of prophecy. If you don't have the spirit of prophecy in your life, oh, I believe in the prophetic. Who's the prophet in your life? Now, I understand I'm preaching to the choir here. Most of you would instantly say who the prophet in your life was. They love their prophet. 
That's why. That's the only reason why God told us to require people to refer to us as Prophet Kitty and Prophet Russ. Not because we could care less about titles. But just as we call someone Pastor Smith or Pastor Joe, and we don't think there's anything wrong with that, because pastors are received in the kingdom of God. They're received among God's people. But you say prophet this or prophet that, and people wrinkle up their noses. It's not because they reject the person, they reject the prophetic. And they're not prospering. They're broke. But they're on food stamps. But there's enough people that are hungry for God that are making up the difference. God's sending sure. us to those who have oh, ears we're pushing, to hear. And we're pushing the envelope. And we're eyes going to be faithful. I feel like mm-hmm. Isaiah. He said, I am not a dumb dog that I cannot bark. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> but believe the prophet, so shall you prosper. Who's the prophet in your life? Of course, when uh, God stopped answering by Urim, mm-hmm. there was this period of time called the Judges. And we're going to read the book of Judges. But the book of Judges was a very heart-rending time in Israel. It was a time of uh, failure, captivity, brokenness, fracture, uh, families torn apart, people dying. uh, uh, Because every man was condemned to do what... When you don't have a prophet in your life, you are condemned to do what's right in your own eyes. And we have so gotten so skewed in our thinking in our religious culture that we actually champion that as the height of spiritual freedom. And it's not. It's religious bondage because our eyes have been put out, our ears have been stopped, our tongues have been, been silenced because we haven't been taught. And then, and then the, the perversion and the, the deception of the prophets coming out and saying, oh, I'm going to be that for you. No, true prophets always activate you in hearing the voice of God for yourself, or they haven't done their job. So when the Urim was cast, it meant that God had done all that he would do. God cast the Urim, and then it said, then the Ephraim and Joseph and Manasseh took what God promised. The responsibility of the tribe was to go and take the land indicated. There was no follow-up question. No rationalizations. Oh no, every time I get a powerful prophecy, that's one reason we do prophetic counseling. Because I get a powerful prophecy and I'm thinking, this is really neat. And it's hitting me so hard, I'm levitating three feet off the ground. I'm shaking all over. I wake up on the floor and I know God spoke. But in the back of my head, there's this little thing. If I could just ask one question. Mm. I asked a question like that one time. And uh, I heard a man on the platform answer me in English. Two very specific questions. And I thought, that's the most powerful word of knowledge I've heard. But he was actually just praying in tongues and I heard him in English. Glory. And uh, God's not intimidated by questions, but we have to understand it's an assignment. The Urim didn't tell you what God would do for you. It told you what your portion was, and then you had to go get it. Amen. Many people come to the prophetic wanting to know what God will do for them without any action on their part. And these people ultimately wind up despising the prophetic. Why? Because nobody likes to be be given an assignment. However pleasant the words are, you need to understand the words, however pregnant with promise they are, they are an assignment. You must figure out what is God asking of me? What What is my assignment? What am I supposed to be moving toward? Because the kingdom doesn't come with observation. You must act. You must take action. You must move toward, even if it seems impossible. Do what you can. There's been times that all I could do was pick up the phone. That's all I could do. And one phone call put a million dollar piece of property at our disposal. Mm-hmm. One phone call. Mm-hmm. One phone call. Do what you can do, even if your head says you're going to make a fool out of yourself if you do it. So the Urim was cast. It's an assignment from heaven. What is your assignment from heaven? What is the Lord telling you to do? What instructions or encouragements have you ignored in God's word or dismissed in prophetic words given you from time to time. You need to go back and hold yourself accountable. And if you will, you will come into your possession. Amen. If you choose rather to defend yourself with ambiguous religious questions about God's faithfulness, nothing will change. If you erect walls of theology, most of the prophetic schools and the prophetic books and teachings that you read, 
I look at them and, and it's they say how to move in the prophetic and get breakthrough. And I read the book and it's about how not to move in the prophetic and how not to have breakthrough because it's just some man writing a book defending his reputation rather than championing what God's word says. Let me tell you something. They're trying to play it safe. But the, Peter made the remark about Paul's writings. He says people take what Paul does and they're arresting it to their own destruction. In other words, anything that is powerful and genuine and will bring change in your life can also do damage when it is twisted by the ignorant and the unlearned. God is so willing to write off the ignorant and the unlearned in order to empower everybody else who, is, who has a true heart and a pure heart toward the things of God. And we need to quit playing it safe Amen. with our doctrine and playing it safe with the mandates of scripture and realize that some people are going to trip up and guess what they can't make a mess that God can't clean up Amen. and we're going to be there to love them and help them and believe me we've done it Amen. God doesn't want us playing it safe he wants us not to erect walls of theology that says well God won't always follow through prophets say a lot of things like somebody said one time, this is what I hear the Lord saying, and the person answered me back, oh, you're going to bring him into it, are you? Hmm. Yikes. Oh, man. Broke my heart. Things can be different. But we have to be sendable, spendable, and bendable to his will. Amen. And if you'd read the remainder of the chapter, this lengthy chapter that we're reading here. <laughs> Uh, verse 5, And the border of the children of Ephraim, according to their families, was thus. Even the border of their inheritance on the east side was Adarothdar and Beth Horon, the upper. And the border went out toward the sea to Mephha on the north side. And the border went out eastward to Tanath Shiloh. And passed by it on the east of Janoha. And went down from Janoha to Adar, Adaroth and Naroth, and came to Jericho, and went out at the Jordan. The border went out from Tepuna westward into the river Cana, and going out thereof were at the sea. This is the inheritance of the tribe of Ephraim by their families. And the separate cities for the children of Ephraim were among the inheritance of the children of Manasseh, all the villages, all the cities with their villages, and they drave not out the Canaanites that dwelt in Gezer, but the Canaanites dwell among the Ephraimites unto this day and serve under tribute. So they didn't drive out all the Canaanites. Hmm. Instead, they said, let's just make them pay tribute. Is that what God said to you? Mm -hmm. Did he say, go and put those people under tribute? What did he say? Drive them out. And you study centuries of history of the Israelites were plagued by the Canaanites that Ephraim refused to follow through. Yeah, I know the prophecy said I'm supposed to do this, but I got a better idea. I think it needs to go like this. See, here you see God gave them the territory, but, but the tribe of Ephraim did not drive them out. So God gave them the inheritance, but they didn't follow through. Is it because, you know, they would blame God. We made the effort. It was too costly. In other words, they weren't willing to pay the price. Right. Is it because God didn't honor his word? Yeah, the Bible says a lot of things. You know, I know it says by his stripes you were healed, but hey, hmm. you know. No buts about uh, it. No, I know he said he'd meet all my needs according to his riches and glory, but it's easier to max out that credit card with a 24% APR mm -hmm. than it is to trust in God and wait on God. Notice that the scripture doesn't tell us why they didn't drive out the Canaanites. It's the question they dare not ask or the observation they dare not make. The fact that the Canaanites were driven out is this stark contradiction to everything God said would happen. How many of you have contradiction to what God said would happen? No doubt the Ephraimites cried out to God many times. Why God? How frustrating it must have been for them. God told us that you know these Canaanites would all be gone. How come they're gone? Because they put them under tribute. They had another idea. They deviated from what God said. They allowed logic and rationale to, to cause them to change the plan of God. 
It didn't say God didn't follow through. It said Ephraim didn't drive him out. The implication is if they had sought God and listened to God, they would have had full implementation of what God promised. It isn't that God failed. They did not say, well, God says a lot of things in his word. God is sovereign. He can, he can be a liar if he wants to. Mm -hmm. I know he said by his stripes you were healed, but he can lie if he wants to because he's sovereign. Mm -hmm. We know it says he'll provide all of our needs according to his riches and glory, but we still had to max out our credit cards and get upside down in our mortgage because God, God is sovereign and he could uh, say something and not back up his word if he wants to. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's where most mm -hmm. theology is today. He can't lie. <laughs> See, the implication is God did his part and it was up to Ephraim to do their part. Why didn't they drive him out? No doubt it was difficult. So they came up with an alternative. Instead of driving them out, they put them under tribute. In other words, there was a monetary advantage. Hey, why do we have to see our loved ones, see our young soldiers risk their lives? These guys make money. They, they're hard workers. Let's put them under tribute. Let's tax them. How many times due to financial considerations do we compromise because something is hard or challenging and we don't follow through on what God promised? Then we come back and we complain to God and question his word. How many times does God tell us to take some money and give it to someone in need? And because it challenges us, instead we'll say, we'll approach them and we'll say, God laid it on my heart to make you alone. Uh -uh. And what happens? It destroys the relationship. Mm. How many times do we do these things? The promises of God become so murky and obscure that we choose not to act upon their simplicity. Drive out the Canaanites? Is that fair? Wouldn't it be better to put them under tribute and collect money? from them and we see this all the time instead of keeping it simple we'll loan somebody money instead of giving it to them and the relationship is destroyed how often do we have a better idea and we muck up the simple plan of God with our rationalizations and then we cry and complain and say God didn't do what he said the prophet missed it or when we don't have any other excuse we say well God is sovereign he can break his word if he wants to let the word of God discern the situation. I absolutely get being under pressure and struggling to make a God-honoring decision. Remember that God's word is always available to us to show us the way out. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing us to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. So let the word of God discern. Are things hard? Then let the word of God discern and you'll see the way out. Stop trying to come up with a better idea or a theology that lets us off the hook and submit to the simplicity of God's word. When things are hard, the scripture speaks directly to that. Proverbs 13, 15 says, Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. Mm. So are things hard? The way of transgressors is hard. What's the solution? Good understanding. Notice there's not a moral quotient to that statement. It's not, oh, you're saying I'm in sin? Pride goes before a fall. I've just located your problem. No, it says understanding gives favor. We're operating in ignorance. Are we ignorant because God hasn't spoken? Are we ignorant because we haven't consulted the specific word of the Lord through the modern day Urim of the prophetic? Are we ignoring what God's word said and operating contrary to his purposes? See, if the way of the transgressors is hard, let the word of God discern. If nothing, else, don't you tell me I missed God. I know it. Well, is it hard? Then you need to go find out where you transgressed. Where did you operate in ignorance when you could have operated in understanding? I understand that rakes over our emotions. And that touches tender spots in our lives. Genocides. But do you want something to be different? <laughs> What? We talked about Jebusites. It's yesterday. Jebusites. It's being downtrodden. Do you want things to be different? My job isn't to feel sorry for you while nothing changes. 
in the prophetic. There's plenty of ministers out there that will feel sorry for you, pat your hand, and just tell you just go to heaven just as miserable as you possibly could until Jesus comes. That is not my style. That's right. And that is not my mandate. And I don't think you'd be hanging around if that's what you wanted. Uh, it's not any, I'm not impugning your walk. I'm trying to help you attach yourself to the catapult of God's word so that he can fire you into a new geography of blessing for your life. Mm. So ask yourself. Ask God. I go to bed. you got to know. <laughs> I never preach something I haven't experienced. Amen. Whenever I'm under pressure, I go, to, I go to God every night. I say, okay, God, you're capable of speaking. I'm capable of hearing. Is that not what I do? It's the truth. Sometimes I do it with tears on my cheeks. God, you're capable of speaking. I'm capable of hearing. Please speak to me. If you want me to do something different, tell me. Where is the deviation? Where have we capitulated Given into people. We were in a situation, a ministry we were a part of. God told us, what, how many times? About three times? At least, yeah, three times. To resign this ministry. And there was nothing wrong. It was wonderful. It was like, it was like being immersed in warm honey. We all loved each other so much. And God kept telling us, resign, resign, resign. And we'd offer our resignation and they'd come kiss our cheeks. And we love you so much. You can't leave us. We just need you. We love you. We want you. Please don't leave. And we would give in. That's idolatry. See, we let people <laughs> talk us out of what God was saying. Mm -hmm. And guess what? The, came, the time came that the resignation became necessary for very uncomfortable reasons. That's right. But if we'd obeyed God a year before... It would have had a different taste in our mouth, and it was a decision that has implications for us today and heartbreaking, much worse implications for the people. Because had we left, I honestly believe there's some things, man, those, the people that were in that ministry, most of them, their lives were utterly destroyed because of circumstances and situations that I honestly believe if we'd obeyed God and left with a mouthful of warm honey Instead of waiting till they were provoked to get in the way of what God was doing, things would have turned out different. See, it's not only what the cost is to your life for finding the will of God, it's what's it going to cost the people around you. And it's a very sobering thing. See, we capitulate to people, we give in to circumstance, we fail to follow through on what our part. God makes the promise, we're supposed to take the land. Are there hard decisions you've ruled out that are actually in your grasp, but you just don't have the willingness or the courage? And I know what that's like. I remember somebody came to me and told me, you need to shut your business down in two weeks or you're going to be destroyed. God's going to destroy you and you will never be anything in the kingdom of God. And I loved this guy and I respected him. And I looked at him and I said, if that's what God wants me to do, all I could say is I don't have the courage to do it. Because he hadn't told you. But the fact of the matter is he hadn't told me. But yet I know what it is. I had to honestly look at myself. Is this? Am I just being having a lack of courage? Well, that wasn't the case, but I know what that feels like. Mm -hmm. Are there hard decisions you're not making just because you're not willing? Ephraim, now listen, and we close with this. Ephraim was the most well, the, the largest, most powerful tribe in Israel. They were well able to take the Canaanites, but for reasons unspoken, they had a better idea. Perhaps they were tired of fighting everybody else's battles because they were required to fight everybody else's battles. But we know this. Do you remember when Moses gave the Ephraimites land on the other side of Jordan? We taught on that in an earlier chapter. In other words, they hadn't entered the promised land. The Ephraimites came to Moses and said, Moses, we don't want to go into the promised land. Can we have this land here? And they almost got killed for doing it. And God said, no, go ahead, let them compromise. Give them what they're asking for. See, they were tired of waiting to go to the promised land. They wanted to settle for less than what God had in mind. That same attitude showed up in their homeland. Are you settling? Are you willing to have second best, third best? There is a theology of suffering in Christianity that's deeply defiling to the faith. It appeals to the lowest common denominator of our resolve. And it turns defeat, suffering, pain, and loss into a perverted treasure and a mark of piety and spirituality rather than what it really is, being overthrown by the enemy. We are taught God allows sickness for his glory. Well, why do we step out of God's will trying to get well then? 
<laughs> Why do we not then simply inject ourselves with some pathogen so we can glorify God more? We are taught that poverty is a good thing and it keeps us humble. Why don't we just quit our jobs then, put on sackcloth and beg in the streets because it honors God to live in destitution? Mm -hmm. There are elements of Christianity so blinded by demonic religious spirits that it is stunning. We come under pressure and yield to these doctrines of demons and sit back and blame God for the outcome. It doesn't have to be this way. We can return to the purity of God's promise and things can be different than they have been. We have to abandon the emotional investments we've made in the geography of suffering and return to the purity of God's word. The time came after the writing of this passage in Joshua that the Canaanites revolted and overthrew the tribe of Ephraim because Ephraim didn't follow through on God's promise for whatever solid, fair, religious reason they came up with for doing so. The results were that the Canaanites plagued Israel for centuries. They destroyed their crops, killed their children, burned their cities, and assassinated their kings. I wonder what the other tribes must have thought. The other tribes suffered because one tribe decided God didn't mean what he said. What about your choices? Suffering in life will migrate. Your suffering will migrate to the lives of those around you. The compromises and rationalizations you make will be reproduced in your children and in your children's children. The tough decisions you make or fail to make will bless those that have come after you or caused them to spiral into a life of suffering because they don't have an example of things being any different. Let us make up our minds like David did when he faced Goliath. Is there not a cause? Let us lay hold of the promise of God and move forward in areas that we can believe and act differently and expect God's promise will come through for us. Life can be better. Long-standing mountains of adversity can be pulled down. New blessing can be experienced when we do our part and act on what God has promised. And I'll close with this story. My father was in his uh, 70s, and he owned property, and, and uh, it was a winter time, and he had to go up on top of, a, of a, a third story of a house. And he went without anybody going with him. He climbed up a ladder. He was on the third story of a house, and he tripped and fell. He rolled, bounced, hit, bounced again, and hit a concrete uh, step. And his body laid there broken and battered. And he drug himself into his car, went to the emergency room. They were very alarmed at what, at what they saw. And he laid there in, in pain and broke, his body was broken. And he said, that'll be enough of that. And he got up and he drug himself out and he left. Mr. Walden, you can't leave. Mr. Walden, we can't answer for what will happen to you if you leave. And he got in his car and he drove home and he crawled up the steps. He was staying in my house at the time. He crawled up the steps and closed the bedroom door and he laid there all morning. And I came home for lunch. And when I came home from lunch, we called up, Dad, are you going to come down? And uh, Dad said, no, I'll be down and he came down and he was black and blue from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. And he sat in front of me and my children. They were all looking at him and their faces were white. He looked like he ought to be on a gurney hooked up to a machine to keep his heart beating. And he got up and started doing handstands and jumping up and down and doing jumping jacks and knee lunges and, and push-ups. And sat down and smiled and picked up a piece of bread and said, God is faithful. See, because he wasn't willing for the assault of the enemy to infect his generations. Amen. Things can be different, folks, if we just take God at his word. Amen. So, Father, we say in our hearts, whatever opposition is there, be it on our own accord or something the enemy's pressing, we just say that'll be enough of that. And we stand up and we shake ourselves and we move forward. We step forward even as an act of faith. We stand up and step forward against the wiles that have been against us. Father, we thank you that greater is he on the inside of us than those things in the world trying to press against us. We thank you that you deliver us from all of our enemies, Father. We thank you that you fight with us for us. And we thank you, Father, for identifying more slices of time if it's two minutes in the bathroom with the door locked, wherever we have to get it, to get quiet with you, to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying so we can act on it immediately, Father. We thank you. Thank you for teaching us to have courage to go all the way with you into our promised land. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.